Ah, uh, it's May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Star Wars Day. we got Stephen Kent joining us to explain why our society is just like the Mandalorian. Uh, rumors of Tucker Carlson's post-Fox career plans are starting to trickle out. We'll dive into those. But we start by doing the collapse of the American city. And really, what I want to do here is basically walk you through a math problem. What do you get when you have 30, 40, 50 years of progressive policies and you see those policies fail? And then instead of going the opposite direction, what you do as a society is double and triple down on those policies by bringing in things like Soros prosecutors to these cities and changing laws and stopping to enforce uh, stopping enforcing those laws uh, even when they still do exist. What happens to your cities? I want to walk you through a couple of American cities. We showed you yesterday El Paso and how devastated that is by illegal immigration. Let me show you a couple of other cities that are dealing with their own problems. We, we take you first to Phoenix, uh, a sandwich shop, a tent city in an American crisis. This is from the New York Times. And I, you know, you can read this from some conservative media as well. But I wanted to bring it to you from the New York Times because I want you to realize that even the mainstream media knows this. They know this is happening and it's happening in front of their eyes. Let me give you some of the highlights of what it's like to run a business in Phoenix right now. He had been coming into work at the same sandwich shop at the same exact time every weekend morning for the last four decades. But now Joe Falache, uh, 69 years old, pulled up to old station subs with no idea what to expect. He parked on a street lined with three dozen tents grabbed his mace and unlocked the door to his restaurant. Why? Why is this happening? Well, a federal court ruling in 2018 required places with no shelter capacity to allow some camping in public spaces. The city's average rent rose by 80 percent during the pandemic. A wave of evictions drove more people from their homes until for the first time ever, more than half of Phoenix homeless population was finding refuge not in traditional places like shelters or temporary apartments, but in cars or tents. So what does that look like? as you're trying to run a sandwich shop or you want people to come to for your place for lunch. Here we go. Homeless people outside slept on Joe and Debbie's outdoor tables. They defecated behind their back porch. They smoked methamphetamine in their parking lot. They washed clothes in their bathroom sink. They pilfered bread and gallon jars of pickles from the delivery trucks. They had sex on their patio, masturbated within views of their employees, and lit fires for warmth that burned down palm trees and scared away customers. Imagine trying to run a business. It's hard enough to run a business and to make it in today's economy. And then you have to face this. Who's going to, would you go get a sandwich at a place where you might just be walking by some guy doing some stuff to himself in view, full view of your kids? Is that what you'd want? Within a half mile of their restaurant, the police had been called to an average of eight incidents a day in 2022. There were at least 1,097 calls for emergency medical help, 573 fights or assaults, 236 incidents of trespassing, 185 fires, 140 thefts, 120 armed robberies, 13 sexual assaults, and four homicides. This is within a half mile of the place you're supposed to go get a roast beef sandwich. Does that make any sense to anybody? It gets worse. The remains of a 20 to 24 week old fetus were burned and left to a dump next to a dumpster in November. Two people were stabbed to death in their tents. 16 others were found dead from overdoses, suicides, hypothermia, or excessive heat. Remember, this is Phoenix. It does get hot. A group of young men in the encampment have begun selling off pieces of the public sidewalk, charging each person $20 a week for what they called lot rent and security. Of course, that seemed ridiculous to one uh, encampment resident until he decided not to pay and then awoke one night to the smell of someone dousing his tent with lighter fuel. Again, there are people trying to sell submarine sandwiches next door. This is what these policies bring to you. And it's not just in Phoenix, but the Phoenix story sadly continues. There was Keisha, barely out of her teens, who had skittered around the encampment like a scared cat, wary of everyone, carrying a few old dolls and crying sometimes. Joel had tried to watch out for her, offering her water or a few minutes inside whenever she was upset. But one weekend when he wasn't around, the temperature was 115 degrees and she lay down on the curb near his gallery and died of heat exposure and dehydration. 
These are terrible individual stories, terrible stories of tragedy, and totally avoidable if you don't do what the left wants for this country. If you just avoid their approaches, you can avoid almost all of these incidents. And you could sell a lot more sandwiches. I will tell you, how do you keep your doors open in a situation like this? When you're trying to have a patio and there could be people hooking up outside in your outdoor tables. It's not just Phoenix, of course. Let's go to San Francisco. San Francisco, a troubled year at a Whole Foods market, reflects a city's woes. What happened at Whole Foods? Now think of what Whole Foods is, by the way. It's a granola place, right? Super, uh, you know, it's like, you know, organic foods and high-end foods. It's very expensive. I mean, it should fit perfectly in San Francisco. Um, they decided to build a store there. Let's see how that went, boys and girls. Last year, the pandemic lockdowns in the rearview mirror, Whole Foods Market made a bet on a gritty San Francisco neighborhood. High-end supermarket chain opened a giant flagship store in a part of the city that is home to both tech companies like Twitter and open-air drug dealing. But the store was soon confronted head-on with many of the problems plaguing the area. People threatened employees with guns, knives, and sticks. They flung food, screamed, fought, and tried to defecate on the floor. A little trend we're noticing in these articles. According to records of 568 emergency calls over 13 months, many depicting scenes of mayhem. Look, this is exactly what you get when you put these policies in place. And of course, this doesn't just affect the people who are not being arrested, people who are doing drugs and killing themselves on the side of the road. It affects the employees who work in the store until, of course, the store closes eventually. And then the people in the neighborhood can't get food. We, we, they always used to talk to us about food deserts. These food deserts are now being created because all the grocery stores are moving out of town. A male with machete is back. The report on one 911 call states another security guard was just assaulted. Another says a man with a four inch knife attacked several security guards, then sprayed store employees with foam from a fire extinguisher, according to a third. In September, a 30 year old man died in the bathroom from an overdose of fentanyl a highly potent uh, opioid and methamphetamine. When Whole Foods announced in mid-April that it was closing the store, it's going to after only 13 months, citing the safety of its employees, many in San Francisco saw it as a representation of some of the city's most intractable problems. Property crimes like shoplifting and car break-ins, an entrenched network of dealers sending fe sending, uh, selling fentanyl and other illicit drugs, and people suffering from untreated mental illnesses wandering the streets. We've talked to Michael, Michael Schellenberger, who, by the way, tried to run for governor to try to solve problems like this. He lives in San Francisco. He wrote a whole book about this. It's called San Francisco. It's worth, it's worth a read if you haven't read it yet. How do you solve these problems? Well, I can tell you what it's not. It's not uh, letting every single person who does drugs let them kill themselves out on the street soaked in their own vomit. That's not the way to do this. But yet progressive cities try it over and over again. Uh, here's another San Francisco situation going on right now. Nordstrom is going to shutter both of its downtown San Francisco stores, citing difficult conditions. In an email to employees, the company's chief store uh, officer wrote that the dynamics of the downtown San Francisco market have changed dramatically over the past several years, impacting customer foot traffic to our stores and our ability to operate successfully. The Westfield Mall and its owner, uh, said in a statement that its planned dis uh, closure underscores the deteriorating situation in downtown San Francisco. A growing number of retailers and businesses are leaving the area due to unsafe conditions for customers, retailers, and employees, coupled with the fact that these significant issues are preventing an economic recovery of the area, the statement said. The mall's owner went on to say that it had expressed serious concerns to city leaders for many years and urged the city to find solutions to the key issues and lack of enforcement against rampant criminal activity activity and on and on and on and on it goes. I can give you this in five other cities easily. This is going on in tons of major left-wing cities across the country and it's totally solvable. These aren't problems that need to exist. You may live near a city where they don't exist but when you do things like this when you allow people to set up tents on the side of the road, when you allow people to go to the bathroom in the streets and do drugs with no penalties and assault people and arrest them and then release them over and over and over and over again, you're incentivizing behavior that ends in this. It ends in the collapse of the American city. 
your cities get destroyed and the citizens inside of them wind up being tortured by criminals that wind up getting out and doing these things over and over and over again. It was back in, I don't remember when the Super Bowl was in San Francisco. That's the last time I was there. And I remember walking down the street at one point and smelling what I can still detect in my nostrils as the worst smell I've ever smelled in my entire life. That was before a lot of this stuff happened. It was just encampments and disgusting things happening on the sides of the road. And then people walking by trying to do day-to-day things. Well, even that has gone now. Even the ability to stick to a normal life and just go to the store to get some groceries, to go to a sandwich shop and pick up some lunch, to go to a store and pick up some clothes for your kids when they're starting school. That stuff can't even happen in San Francisco anymore. More and more every single day, these these societies go downhill. Then the sane people wind up leaving leaving the rest of the voting community to be nonstop nutjobs that want AOC's vision of the world. This is a formula that is going to fail and is failing in front of our eyes. It's a sad, sad truth to see what's going on at the border in all these left-wing cities. It is the collapse of the American city and it should make us all very, very upset and we need to fight back against it. I don't want to depress you all day today, though. Today is, of course, May the 4th, uh, Star Wars Day. We're going to bring on Stephen Kent to talk about how that and the Star Wars universe ties into what we're seeing today in America. That's in a second. You know, we kind of throw everything at our livers Cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, Tylenol, cigarettes, everything. You kind of just, everyone, I don't know, we live an American lifestyle. It's not always the best, most healthy lifestyle. So many of us have sluggish, fatty liver that makes um, many of us gain weight, lose energy. For decades now, your liver has helped you with over 500 key functions every single day. It's time for you to help your liver with Liver Health Formula. Liver Health Formula is an all-natural supplement. It contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. If you're looking to ignite your fat-burning metabolism, boost your energy, and transform how you look and how you feel, try Liver Health Formula and receive five free gifts when you order today. You get the bottle of blood sugar formula as well to reduce your sugar cravings, and you'll get four free eBooks to support every aspect of your health. Try Liver Health Formula today by going to getliverhelp.com slash stew. Get your five free bonus gifts. It's getliverhelp.com slash stew to try Liver Health Formula today. I'm happy to welcome Stephen Kent back to the program. He's the editor of This Is The Way on Substack and author of How the Force Can Fix the World, Lessons on Life, Liberty, and Happiness from a Galaxy Far, Far Away, which you can pick up wherever you get your books. Stephen, may the fourth be with you. May the fourth be with you, <laughs> Stu. I also feel like we have to say this is the way now. Like I, it's it's sort of supplanted may the force be with you. Yeah, you know, that's where I was going to start with you, actually. It, it, you know, your Substack is, is you know, this is the way. And it really does feel like that that phrase has risen, maybe not entirely to the level. I mean, the, you know, may the force be with you is really a generational thing. But mm-hmm. this is the way is really something that has made real inroads into our culture from a show that while, you know, is obviously a lot of people watch, I don't think you can compare the viewership to what you saw from Star Wars back in the day. Why is this so, so, uh, so deep into our culture already? Well, I remember being in Dallas and being at the blaze with you guys, and we were talking about the rollout of the Mandalorian show before it even existed. And we were all uh, just kind of reflecting on whether or not this was going to meet exactly what Star Wars fans were hungering for or saying that they wanted after the sequel trilogy, you know, was really, really quite a bit of a dud. Um, And boy, it did meet the stated demand of like a fresh Star Wars story with brand new characters, not messing with legacy plot lines and, you know, getting a little bit creative around the margins. The Mandalorian is really, really blown up. I see Baby Yoda stickers and uh, this is the way bumper stickers everywhere. I mean, just as much as you might see classic Star Wars memorabilia. So just from a marketing and messaging standpoint, there is something really special about Mando. 
Yeah, it really, it's really done. They've done a pretty amazing job with this, even more than some of the spinoff movies that have come out oh, yeah. uh, of this of the the general. Uh, when, when is the last time you saw Ray or Finn on a car? Yeah, <laughs> no, I know it's true. It really is true. It, it, this has really done something different, and I guess maybe because this is the first one in the streaming era, it's a, it was a different approach. I don't know what it was exactly. Um, in fact, you talk about this in one of your latest uh, posts, The Mandalorian in an Age of Estrangement. And mm -hmm. in the post, you talk about a poll that we discussed a little bit uh, here a few weeks ago, where it was kind of a depressing poll, honestly. The, the major changes going on with the American people and the way they view important parts of uh, American citizenship, you know, things like patriotism. Um, and you kind of go through that and how it ties into The Mandalorian. Can you walk people through this? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. And, you know, it was one of those things where you're watching a TV show. You're just minding your own business. I was watching the new episode of The Mandalorian uh, when they kicked off the latest season. And it starts with the character known as Bo-Katan. She's a Mandalorian who is not part of uh, Din Djarin, you know, the Mandalorian's little um, uh, religious organization where they all wear their helmets. And she is alone. She's been ditched by her former comrades. She has no army. She has no chance of ever claiming the throne of Mandalore, which was her big dream. And this is the same day when that poll comes out showing that we have just hollowed out our culture of religiosity, communitarian values, identification with the institution of family, the desire to even have children. And Mandalorian has this going on at the same time. If you flash back to the previous season, uh, Bo-Katan comes into conflict with the Mandalorian because she derides his uh, his sect group as a cult. She says the children of a watch are a cult. That's the group that he's part of. They all wear their helmets. Uh, and she doesn't like them. And she thinks that they are sort of weird, rudimentary, uh, I don't know, just weirdos. Uh, but then in this latest season, she joins. She joins the way when she finds herself having nobody to back her up and nothing but her own company. That's really interesting to me, honestly, um, as a statement of, I think, people's desire to knock religion and community affiliation uh, because it has rules and strictures. Uh, but then as soon as everything falls apart for you, that's exactly what you want. You want rules, guidelines, and people to support you. Yeah, you have a great line. Everything looks like a cult to the loner with no ties or obligation to others. That's a great point. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's, yeah. it's an interesting um, uh, side by side to America, because, I mean, one of the most important things about America is its individualist streak. Right. Like there, that's mm -hmm. a big part of it. It's part of the reason that I love it here. It's part of it's a very central part to both my politics and I know yours as well. Individualism is really, really important. But so is community. And at times, if, if those two things get out of balance, uh, any civilization can go downhill pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I find myself struggling with this often as a quite individualistic libertarian. Uh, when I find myself talking to people who see the world the way that I do, share my politics, uh, you know, I sense it in them, this sort of uh, desire to lash against the idea that you ever have any obligation to the larger society, uh, that rules that are enforced across the society might be generally good for everybody, and that a common good can exist. Now, when I hear common good, like my skin crawls, because that's just like the language of the left, that's the language of people who want to control you. But in a sense, it still does exist. Uh, that is why we are having a, a vicious national debate over these just weird fringe issues like drag queen story hour and cross-dressing and transgenderism. Do you remember when we thought that the David French Sorab Amari debate over drag queen story hour was like – sort of it was treated as a, a weird niche debate that had no real relevance. Mm -hmm. And then one year later, after they did that big debate in front of a live audience, it's all that we talk about. Um, you know, this is kind of what happens when you detach yourself, particularly in the liberty movement, from the idea that society actually should have boundaries. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, you, you talk about uh, in the piece about how um, the Mandalorian is is positioned to talk uh, about 
uh, a, a Tower of Babel moment that could be coming at any time. Um, I thought that was an interesting observation because it's different than maybe the thing, the thing that came out of the prequels, for example, a, a different thing they were talking to, maybe that, that battle between liberty and mm -hmm. security that we remember and we've discussed before. Uh, what, what is the Mandalorian approach here that it's different than the Star Wars series? Well, it's just it was interesting to me in that Wall Street Journal poll that you had this uh, decline of all affiliation with traditional institutions. And the only thing that people seemed to identify more with in that survey was their desire for money. And the Mandalorian like starts his journey in that show as a bounty hunter who's just kind of living paycheck to paycheck, job to job. Uh, and his story as it it meets baby Yoda, he then sort of adopts uh, responsibility. He, has, mm. he adopts stewardship of someone who needs his protection. And in the most recent season, he adopts Gro Grogu as his actual son. Um, obligation to others and having these kinds of responsibilities puts him on the hero's journey. If he just continued to live for himself and just do bounty hunter client work, I mean, he was never going to help save anybody or restore Mandalore. The journey only begins when he accepted more responsibility. Like, what message could be better, particularly for young men of America today who are unmoored, I think, from their own sense of societal obligation? And also, the society is unmoored from wanting anything from them. You know, like our culture has told young men to shove it uh, mm -hmm. and they and they kind of in response are, uh, and that's not really good for anybody. It's just these sort of interesting parts about Mandalorian that connect, like it is a show about finding the way to live your life, uh, and nothing is more relevant right now in our culture. You know, it's a very similar to another uh, culturally impressive film, Transporter 2, uh, <laughs> which I'm starting my own blog of, uh, just so you know, I'm starting my own Substack. Uh, yeah. tra how Transporter 2 ties into American culture. We're, we're, I don't want to be a competitor with you, Stephen, but just it's so you know It's part of our like, modern mythology, right. Transporter 2. <laughs> it really and, you know, Jason Statham, you know, people are going to have like little busts of him on their, uh, by their bedside, you know. Could amazing. happen at, at any time. Lots of Jason Statham stickers on minivans as well. Uh, Stephen, before you go, we've talked about like how this ties into culture and all really serious things, but like give me an outline of what we can expect from the Star Wars universe coming up. But what are the projects that are coming? Yeah, so I'll start with the bad news. Uh, they're bringing Ray back. So <laughs> Ray, Ray is getting her own movie. I think it's going to be a single standalone film here in about two years uh, where she's going to be rebuilding the Jedi Order after the rise of Skywalker, Episode Nine. So it's not going to be a numbered Star Wars film as far as we know. Um, so take that put it aside, we'll go to the good news. Uh, the good news is that they are really going back further in the timeline to completely uncharted territory. I'm a child of the old Republic. I loved those video games and all those kinds of books when I was growing up mm. in the extended universe of Star Wars. And that's now what they're gonna be putting a lot of focus on, the dawn of the Jedi, the foundations of the order in like the stone age of Star Wars. And when you think about what will help keep fans happy, it is that kind of stuff. It's the tampering with the original Star Wars trilogy that lights people's hair on fire. Um, and so if they go into these uncharted timelines, I think that's going to be really good. The last thing is that if you are a fan of Grand Admiral Thrawn uh, and the Heir to the Empire trilogy, which, again, also melted down the Star Wars fandom when Disney threw it out the window, it, it's all coming back. The next three years of Star Wars are going to be all about Grand Admiral Thrawn, this kind of niche Star Wars character from the old days, uh, who is now going to be in live action uh, and doing several movies. So brace yourself, Star Wars fans. There, there's some good stuff ahead if uh, you didn't cancel your subscription. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Stephen Kent, uh, be sure to check out his work on the This Is The Way substack and pick up a copy of his book as well, How the Force Can Fix the World, Lessons on Life, Liberty, and Happiness from a Galaxy Far, Far Away. Stephen, thanks so much for coming on the program. This Is The Way.
So what is the way when you're thinking about buying a new home, selling your home? What do you do? Well, you could go on the website and just click the name under the house that you want. <laughs> that's not a good idea. Believe me, that's a terrible idea. You want to go a different direction. You want to go to a different website. You want to go to a website called realestateagentsitrust.com. There, you will uh, find a website that screens all the agents before they even get to you. You get the best ones in the area. Glenn was talking about this on the, early, on the radio show earlier today. If you don't know, this is a company Glenn started many years ago. Um, and he was talking about how it takes weeks and weeks and weeks for these agents to actually become eligible to come on because they want to have these conversations. They want to check their results. They want to make sure these are the best agents for you. Uh, so check it out, uh, realestateagentsitrust.com. It's a free service to you, realestateagentsitrust.com. Check it out now, realestateagentsitrust.com. I don't know. If you got fired, would people be looking at you as saying, wow, I'd love to be that guy? Probably not, right? Like, that's the way, when you lose your job, it kind of sucks usually. You have to kind of figure out what you're going to do next. I got to say, the this Tucker Carlson thing is going the total opposite direction. This guy is going to get so much money thrown at him, and he's going to have so much focus on whatever he does next that I think all of us kind of just want to be Tucker Carlson right now. He's off. He's getting paid a lot of money to do nothing. And eventually, he's going to get paid even more money to do exactly whatever he wants. Uh, that's basically the concept of the Tucker Carlson story in Washington Post today. Tucker Carlson floats plan to host alternative GOP debate in, in post-Fox future. A lot of details in here, a lot of rumors. Uh, Blaze is mentioned in here. Uh, lots of different uh, networks are mentioned, of course. Uh, let me give you this nugget. This might be the most important nugget in here. Tucker Carlson, who was fired by Fox News last week at the height of his popularity, has aspirations of moving into a larger role that doesn't limit him to a single medium. Uh, he is willing to walk away from some of his millions of dollars that Fox is owed, owes him under his contract um, if that would give him the flexibility to have a prominent voice in the 2024 election. Most ambitiously, Carlson wants to moderate his own GOP candidate forum outside of the usual structures of the Republican National Committee debate system. The idea, which has been discussed with Donald Trump, uh, would test his vaunted sway over conservative politics, and it would take a jab at his former employer, Fox, is hosting the first official primary debate, which Trump has threatened not to attend. Pretty interesting. I mean, I would like to see a debate moderated by Tucker Carlson. I think that's where you really get interesting things. Getting some left-wing nut job to come out here and ask questions doesn't give me anything at a primary. I would rather see a conservative who understands the, the nuances of the back and forth of a debate to really, like, see where these candidates are and what they can answer and what they know. So I think that would be a really fascinating thing to watch. The Tucker Carlson thing is developing uh, as we speak, and we will give uh, all the updates as they come about. By the way, if you happen to be uh, a Tucker Carlson refugee, uh, you've, you've been given asylum here on Stu Does America, 8 p.m. Eastern. We, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, until Tucker comes back, we're holding down the fort. Uh, there is a, another uh, article, of course, you cannot be surprised by. Good riddance, GOP lawmakers privately gl are at glee uh, at Tucker Carlson's firing. The same thing happened when Glenn decided to leave Fox News. Uh, they were very happy. A lot of the GOP uh, mainstream people are not that happy about having a very loud, very public, very opinionated voice, someone who cares about the Constitution and cares about things that, you know, like, I don't know, reigning in spending. They want to keep spending. So they want to be able to say that they're tough on that stuff, but they don't want to actually do it. So when someone keeps calling them out and telling, you know, them to call their Congress people, it annoys them. So they think uh, getting Fo Tucker off of Fox is going to make this go away. I got news for you. This is not going to solve your problems, GOP. And you know what? Kind of happy about that. Ah, tonight is the big night, everybody. Blaze TV is releasing our first ever full-length comedy film. It's called Reopening, and it's a mockumentary that follows the cast and crew of a small community theater as they struggle to reopen during the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think you're really going to like this. It's really funny. It has a, you know, it allows you to kind of mock and make fun of the COVID-19 restriction stuff that we all had to deal with. You know, we were talking about Saturday Night Live of how they continually, now they have, they're not even doing shows now because of the writer's strike, but how they continually avoid obvious things they should be mocking because they're part of the left religion. 
Well, I got news for you. You don't have to, Comedy doesn't have to be that way. You can go back to the old way where everyone gets mocked for everything. Uh, that's the best way to go. Head over to blazetv.com slash reopening and use the code reopening to get 20 bucks off your subscription. Right now, it's blazetv.com slash reopening. You can check out the show later tonight. blazetv.com slash reopening. Promo code reopening. 20 bucks off. You don't want to miss this one. Check it out tonight. I'm joined now by Dr. Sean Rowland. He is the founder and CEO of Jace Medical. Dr. Rowland, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we've talked about Jace Medical on the show a bunch of times uh, before, but you are looking to solve a problem here, I think, that's really important. Because we are, I think, incredibly susceptible to countries that we view as either complete enemies or just adversary in some adversarial way. We are really dependent on them for our medication. Can you kind of walk us through what made you think of starting your company and, 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 and approaching things this way? Yeah, sure. It really, you kind of hit on it right there with our dependency on, on overseas production of, of our pharmaceuticals. I mean, it was something that I didn't know about uh, as a physician. You know, I'm a family medicine physician. I uh, was working in a community hospital, could have been anywhere in the country because they're all dealing with the same things. Um, and before the pandemic, uh, we were dealing at that time with some shortages of some pretty important medications. And that was just kind of an eye-opening moment for me and led me to, to look into it deeper and come to find out that, that yeah, we have virtually no production capacity here for, our, for the United States citizen when it comes to their daily medications, these, these generic common medications that people take every day for whether it's blood pressure, whether it's diabetes, um, or even our antibiotics. Uh, all of this stuff comes from outside the United States, uh, with most of it, China, uh, being, being kind of the main, the main producer. You know, it's funny because we talk a lot about manufacturing leaving the country, and, and that's been a problem that we've been talking about for decades. And honestly, for some things, it, it's a little bit overblown. You look at, like, us as a manufacturing country, we're still the number two manufacturing country in the world. We export tons of stuff still to this day. But medicine does seem to be one of these things that we've just completely abandoned trying to produce. This sounds like a bad idea. Can you give us a, a sense of the scale of this when you talk about our, our medications being made overseas? Yeah, you're right. Uh, so look, when we talk about, I mentioned generic medications. Those account for about 90, the, the numbers range, but about 95% of, of what's prescribed on a daily basis, mm -hmm. what's consumed on a daily basis in the U.S. So that's a big number, right? It's basically sure. everything's a generic medication. Of those generic medications, virtually 100%. Are, are produced outside the U.S. Um, some of the designer stuff, some of the newer drugs that that uh, you know that, that that are still patented, we do have some production capacity there. Mm -hmm. In this generic space, which accounts for everything, uh, we just don't. And and you can look at historically at how China positioned itself um, really strategically to to basically subsidize that, that uh, the market and, and subsidize those, those manufacturers in order to bring that manufacturing back to China. Uh, and, and it's not just us, this is worldwide. So we're in line with all the rest of the countries when it comes to, to where these, that, that these medications are coming from, from China and India and, and a few other countries. Um, and so it's a global problem. And I think it's important to, to realize that uh, also because it means when that shortage happens, we'll be standing in line with, with other countries uh, and, and it's, it's scary. It's a scary position to be in. Yeah, I mean, because that worst case scenario where, you know, God forbid we are at war with China or just a full out trade stoppage of some sort, we're going to have no access to this, access to this stuff. It's, I don't know how, I don't know how we could. I don't know what we, because we, we just, if that, if, you know, those, those, that supply chain, if it was shut down, uh, it would take a matter of weeks before our shelves, our medic, you know, your pharmacy would have no medications. And That's in order to incredible. build this production capacity back up, uh, we're talking years and years. Mm -hmm. you, you don't just start a factory and start making penicillin. Uh, you have to ferment. The, the, there's a whole fermentation process. It takes a long time. Sure. And so you're talking years to build up, uh, to build up any kind of a production capacity. So, yeah, it's something that I, there's national security implications. I mean, there's, there's a lot at stake here. I mean, and you're talking about um, basically our day-to-day -day needs for medicine being controlled by a communist dictator, really, and it, on its whim. Yeah. I mean, th this is something they could turn off in theory at any moment. It's an ace, yeah, I think it's an ace up their sleeve that I'm sure our leaders know about, and I th it does 
it does make you think about some interesting implications about, uh, you know, the Taiwan Strait, which is where a lot of this stuff comes through. Um, we already know how, how fragile things are in that part of the world, and it just wouldn't take much. So, uh, you know, this is something that now we're, we're a small company. We, we're not, you know, on the geopolitical stage. We're nobody. Uh, <laughs> but me as a, as a family physician wanting to provide some measure of protection, some measure of, pe of a peace of mind for, for my family, for my community, that was ultimately, you know, I, I can't solve the, the, I can't bring production back to the U.S. tonight. Right. right? But what I can do is, is empower people, provide them access um, on, on a personal level to at least do, you know, what we can. And, and so that's, that's been our efforts now. We started with antibiotics. We're getting into the chronic medications. And we're expanding into some other things here down the road as well. Just all with the goal of, of putting that back into the people's hands to be able to do things for, the, for themselves, for their loved ones. Yeah, I know you've been working on a solution to this, and, and at least for individuals, which is really important. I want to get into that in a second, but let me hit one more thing here. We talk about this, like, uh, this, you know, geopolitical storm that could come that could set this off in a big way. Yeah. But, like, I think Americans kind of tend to believe that without, absent that sort of catastrophe, they should have access to the medications that they need. We're the United States. Of course we get it, right? Like, we get what we need to get. That's what we've come to believe. Yeah. But I will tell you, just, you know, having kids, having, you know, my, my medical issues occasionally of my own, right now yeah. it's hard to get. Have you, have you tried to get children's Tylenol lately? Yeah. You're it's right. really hard just yeah. to get basic medications. Now, I guess some of that could be explained by COVID and, and the fallout of that a couple of years ago, but why is this still happening now? Yeah, I, I, I ask me, I ask that question to myself every day. Like, mm -hmm. what, what? COVID was. We're now out of out of COVID, right? Yeah. And, and we should have been able to recover from a lot of these, and and we're still dealing. If not, things are worse. I think in in a lot of regards, especially with medications. I mean. Uh, you know, we mentioned the children's Tylenol. Uh, we've ran into a couple internally where we hear maybe this thing's going to be in shortage and it's one of our medications. And so we try and ramp up on, on what we can get for our customers. But really, at the end of the day, I, I, it's getting worse. It's not just supply chain, though. I think mm -hmm. also think about when you're traveling. You're overseas and, you know, it's hard. To, maybe you're in a foreign country. You're not sure how the health system there works. Right. And, and you've got, you know, you've got a sinusitis or your wife has a urinary tract infection, infection something like that. Having the ability to, to manage that condition on your own or you're, or you're in the backcountry or you're in the middle of a natural disaster. The, the, we've seen that it doesn't take much for the health system to, to be overwhelmed. Um, and so if we can add a little bit of more protection there, I think, I think that's where people need to just take a mo moment, stop and think about, about their situation, their, their lifestyle. It's not just if China goes to war with the U.S. Right. Um, there's so many other reasons why it makes sense as long as you can do it safely, appropriately. Feel like you're backed up if you've got questions. That's all part of the service. And then it's, it's almost like, you know, you've got Tylenol, you've got Advil uh, in, your, in your medicine cabinet. Well, here's some, some other medications that everyone should have. Yeah, uh, the access. basics. That's the kind basics. of where you started with this, the Jace case, right? Yeah, We've talked exactly. about the Jace case before. This provides you with some basic antibiotics for basic things that, that everybody faces at some point or another. Yeah. Um, number one, can you describe what's in it? And also, like, how do I know when to take these things? Yeah, right. I, so, I'm definitely the idiot that would take the wrong one. <laughs> no, and that's, and that's part of, you know, I'm big on education with my patients, uh, taking the time to explain you know, why we're doing what we're doing, answer questions. And so we tried to carry that over into the service and make it accessible for everyone. So in the kit, you've got, you've got these five antibiotics. They're ones that a lot of people have heard of, maybe some that, that they haven't heard of. Things like Augmentin, mm -hmm. um, which maybe you've taken for, for a sinusitis, um, doxycycline, ciprofloxacin. There's, there's five in total, right? And they cover really a range of those, the most common things that you might encounter if you're out traveling, uh, or maybe in a, in a natural disaster scenario where certain uh, infections might be more prevalent at that time, try to cover for those most common things. But then we also wanted to cover for some of the most deadly things. And that's the, the bioterror stuff. So anthrax, plague, tularemia, those are the three, um, I guess, likely agents that have been identified as a potential um, agent for, for bioterror. Those are virtually 100% fatal but there are treatments for them. And so that's included in, as a part of these, this antibiotic pack. And so that was what we, we went to market with, with the Jace case because that's, you know, everyone, at, like you mentioned, at one time or another, you or someone you know is going to, is going to need an antibiotic. Uh, you know, bacterial infections 100 years ago, 
uh, pre-antibiotic were the top killers uh, uh, that was like the, counted for like the top three or four yeah. causes of death. And we're just so used to it now because we have such easy access. But uh, you know, in the event that something like that were to happen again, natural disasters, any kind of a grade down scenario, that's, that's gonna be a need again. So we've got all those things covered and that's the Jace case. Um, and then today is what we're, we're so excited about is that we've been working really hard to get the Jace daily. And Jace daily is those daily medications, whether you've got a psych disorder, thyroid disorder, high blood pressure, uh, you still need that same access. And so providing people a means to, to, to have uh, up to a year supply of their medications um, for the same reasons as the supply chain and all that um, is something that we're excited about. Now, I happen to be just someone who really hates getting my medications refilled. <laughs> so yeah. could I just get it, get, get a year and so, I don't have to worry about it? Yeah. <laughs> just out of pure laziness. Is that one of your services? Unfortunately, no. And here's the oh, reason. Okay. <laughs> the reason is uh, part of this is, you know, you, do, you have an encounter with our physician. Mm -hmm. They want to know, like, are you, how long have you been taking this? It's stable. Your condition's yeah. stable. And it's certainly that you have regular follow-up. Because what we don't want is to give someone a year of medication and then they, they go away for a year, right. never talk to their doctor, things change in their health that they, and they just don't know. Um, and then the other reason is, the idea here is that you want to maintain that year supply fresh at any given time. So I get you a year supply of medication, you then go get your regular refill, and you'll actually take from your Jace daily supply and then replace it with the stuff you just refilled. Mm. And as you do that, it means you've got, uh, you'll have a forever one year fresh supply uh, as you replenish from your, from your regular refills. So then you really are, you, you, yeah, it. exactly. And then you really are prepared um, in, in a situation where the, the shelves are bare and now you need to wait three, four months to get a medication where you've got a fresh supply always on hand. That's interesting because I think a lot of people, you know, they think to prepare you know, water, food, there, there's certain things that people kind of are on their mind when it comes to preparing for some, you know, negative uh, future event. Yeah. You don't think of medicine. It's not the thing that hits you as like the, the number one thing to prepare for. Yeah. It's to go away quickly. Certainly you don't think about the antibiotics. I think that's for sure. But I, I would say people who have a chronic condition, uh, whether let's just say a, a, psych, a, a psych condition, mm -hmm. those people do. They're very aware of their access or limited access. Um, we have, we've got I've had an anecdotal story of a patient who's on ho um, a hormone therapy mm -hmm. and I, I mean, she depends on this medication every day uh, and was told recently that there was a, a shortage and her pharmacist said, we don't know when this is, there's a chance that we're going to run out of this medication next month. And so she lives in fear every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a real problem that people are dealing with um, and, and just hasn't, have not had a viable solution because you had to pay retail rates because this isn't, insurance doesn't cover a year supply. Right. So you're going to have to go pay retail rates from the pharmacy. You're going to have to pay out of pocket for your doctor visit. Um, and it just becomes, it just becomes inaccessible to just even just due to cost. Mm, amazing. Well, this is a really valuable service, and I know uh, you've worked hard to try to, to come up with something that can help people, and uh, we're excited to talk about it. Uh, it's Dr. Sean Rowland. He's founder and CEO of Jace Medical. Uh, where do they go to uh, find out more details on this? So it's Jace, J-A-S-E, jacemedical.com, and you can on there you can select whether you want to buy a Jace case or, or uh, utilize our Jace daily service. All right, there you go, jacemedical.com. Dr. Sean Rowland, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks a lot, Stu. Get your reviews in on podcast. Five stars are the appropriate number of stars. Uh, Steve writes, it, good. It's good. See, that's all you need. All I need are the stars. You can write whatever you want in the actual comment. Uh, Sherry writes in on YouTube, I love Tucker. He cracks me up. And I'm postmenopausal. Well, there you go. Good good news. Now we have a lot of information. Asa writes, dude, Atticus Finch was a great burn. Oh, with the Glenn interview yesterday. A lot of comments on Glenn's outfit from yesterday. Why is Glenn dressed as the good humor guy? Is it? Is he? Do we have a side by side? Can we look at that? Side. By, oh, there we go. Yeah. You know, I will say Glenn does look like the good humor guy, and he does love ice cream as well. We'll see you tomorrow.